this is already on your paper. What you just did, okay, this is already on that other paper. This is not going in the notes of the new notes we're taking now. This, what you're going to write first is going to be under column chromatography. But let me just go back to what you just did. You just looked up all of these guys online, and we, I, we basically got the definition and what this used for. And then I also had you think of some other places we've used them in the past. Okay? So if we look at decanting, we just decanted by leaving the yeast behind. Stop. <laughs> leaving the yeast behind, and we, uh, and we poured out the top. Uh, filtration, we did at least three filtrations in Chem 1. We did, uh, in the beginning, separating a mixture. We had marbles and sand and sugar and, and iron filings, and we filtered that. Uh, one of the things, we also used a magnet. We also used, uh, um, what else? Just picked it out by color. Right. Uh, we also filtered uh, precipitate, and we filtered the copper. Remember the copper we trapped in the filter paper? They were fully yeah. filtered. Okay. Centrifuge, you only did that once. We had the centrifuge where we separated the milk into the uh, fat on the top and the low-fat milk on the bottom. We just did the ethanol a wa and a water one where we were you know, distilling our alcohol. And these two, you're going to see three labs on. Two on chromatography and one on extraction. Okay, so you'll be able to fill them in later. But let's start with today, chromatography. That's what I'm going to start with right now. The word chromatography, the word chromatography has chrome. You think of chrome. You, you probably think of, uh, well, let me ask you, what do you think of anything of chrome? You think of shiny things, you think of chrome, the metal. Unfortunately, that is true, as most people think of. But if I were to have asked that maybe in a 20, 30, 40 years ago, you might have thought of Kodachrome, which was a type of camera, and it was in color. Chrome is short for color. Chromatids from biology class with chlorophyll in it. All right, chromatids, color. All right, that's actually what chrome stands for not shiny metals. Um, so chromatography is basically color. Right, the reason it's got this name is that you're, most of these guys, we're going to see the paper chromatography in particular, are going to separate things out, and they're going to be in different colors. All right? You're going to see that in both of the labs we do uh, as well. So let's talk about chromatography. Before I do, I need you to work the lights for me. Hit that light for me. And I'll show you a little video clip from CSI. Just a two-minute clip here. Okay, Pay attention to what she's doing. By the way, that's um, this is uh, put out by a company that makes this equipment. And no, it's not anal tech. It's <laughs> anal tech, Cullen. Thank you. It's <laughs> laughing. All right. Now pay attention to what she does in this uh, is scene from CSI. There's a date that she thinks may have been changed. So here's what she does. Pay attention. You'll be doing something very similar to this. Including using those capillary tubes. And you'll see what she's about to see here, only in individuals. Okay, watch. That's a chromatic. There were different inks on the work order, which means the date on the work order was compromised. Tom Harper made a service call to Bianca's house, not in December, but 10 months earlier in February. Okay, so what she did there, she cut the data, get the light back on. She cut the data apart and tested the inks. This is actually one thing we are going to do very similar. We're going to take uh, water-colored, water-soluble markers, and um, we're going to separate them out like she did. You're going to run a chromatogram. I'm going to explain how that works. We're also going to test food colors. See, most of the colors you can think of actually consist of, mo of most of the inks, consist of more than one dye, more than one color in there. And I can separate them out by doing this. This is what you're going to do tomorrow. Well, now, tomorrow you're going to do the column one. You're going to do this on Tuesday because we need more time. You're going to put a little spot of what you want to separate out at the bottom of the paper. Okay? You're going to put maybe about a half an inch of a solution in here, and then you're going to put this into there. Now, this is filter paper, and so it's porous, and it will... What do you think is going to happen when it touches the water? What's the water going to do? If it was a rag, what's it going to do? It's going to soak it up. But it takes a long time. It's going to take about 45 minutes to soak it up high enough to be able to see a separation. So you will see that. We put this water in here, 
and you put this, you drop this down into there, it's going to travel, the water's going to travel up that way, okay, through capillary action, basically, and, you know, absorb, absorbing properties of the, of the uh, filter paper. That little spot at the bottom here is going to travel with it, and if it's made of more than one color, it's going to separate out into the two different colors it has, or three or four, however many colors it has. Right? That's the whole idea behind chromatography, behind paper chromatography. That's what I want to talk about first. Okay? But before I get to paper and specific chromatography, you'll notice I have some generic things to tell you about chromatography. And again, do not write this sentence down. All right? Uh, oh, sorry, there's a second. Yeah, same sentence I had before. This does go down underneath chromatography. Okay? What is it? What's happening? Well, in all kinds of chromatography, in all the kinds we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about three kinds. Gas chromatography, paper chromatography, and column chromatography. They all have two things in common. They all have a stationary phase and they all have a mobile phase. A stationary and a mobile phase. And the way this works is the thing you're trying to separate or even identify will have a different attraction to each of those phases. And therefore, different substances will travel either further or faster through the stationary phase, being carried by the mobile phase. That will make more sense to you as I explain and as you see it happen in front of your eyes when we do the paper chromatography, and as you see the video I'm going to show you on gas chromatography, it will start to make more sense. <laughs> so, the way we separate them and even identify them is based on how fast they're carried through the stationary phase and how far or how far along the stationary phase they move. If you watch remember the video a second ago, those colors separated out because some of them say the blue one was down lower at the end and the yellow one traveled up higher. That meant the blue one didn't travel as fast, didn't dissolve as well into the solution, and was attracted more to the paper. So depending on how fast or how far it moves through the stationary phase, we can identify and separate these things out. By the way, uh, you just saw that part from CSI. I, I, I actually, maybe I'll come in again. Um, the husband of the English sub, who comes in for Clarko, and he was a, she was um, Clarko's uh, student teacher, film student teacher. I forget her last name. Oh, Calvin. Calvin, right. Um, uh, her husband is a um, crime lab guy from Wyoming, you know, state barrack of Wyoming. He does that kind of stuff. He tests blood patterns and spatter patterns. You know, from crime scenes, he tests, uh, you know, I don't, they don't have a DNA thing, I think he said there, but they, they can do blood typing and stuff like that. So that he's, he works at a crime lab. He, uh, when he was here, I asked him, I'm pretty sure, uh, I'm not positive, I'm going to have to ask him again, but I'm pretty sure he said, you wouldn't actually do that to the ink. Um, like those dates. He said, partly because when you cut it up like that and dissolve it in the solution, you've destroyed the evidence. Okay. It's weird, but in a court of law, you can't destroy evidence to test it. Uh, if you, because here's why: if it's destroyed, the defense has to have an opportunity to, uh, to have access to it as well. So he said, there's other ways you can you can test the thing without cutting up the entire paper or right, date and and uh, doing that. But uh, um, it makes for good TV for CSI. All right, so I can separate the stuff out by how fast or how far it moves along that stationary phase. What would cause it? See, if you, can, if you can think about it. If it's attracted really well to this paper phase, you know, he's not going to move as fast. If he's attracted really well to the mobile phase, he's going to get carried along with it. So that's what we're going to have to see. What would make him be attracted to the solid phase versus attracted to the moving phase? Substances with greater attractions to the stationary phase are going to take longer to pass through, and they're not going to move as far. Now, 
Now, I want you to think while you're copying that down, what are some things what that would determine whether or not something was going to travel with the liquid or stay attached, attached to the solid? What would uh, determine that? Think about some of the properties I stressed under organic every time I gave you a new organic functional group. Um, it's boiling point. Well, boiling point was one of the things I, t I stressed. Would that affect have any effect here? Ah, okay. Not so. To answer that, answer the question first. Would that would boiling point have any effect here? No. No. But what would? Solubility, right? Solubility, how well it dissolves in something, and what determines solubility? You just said it a second ago. Polarity. Polarity. Okay. Um, here's another one. What else might determine how fast or how far this stuff moves along? Something very simple, like uh, the same reason I would expect that a semi-tractor trailer is not going to win a race, a 100-yard dash, with uh, a motorcycle. How heavy it is, sure. So all of those things are factors that determine how well he's attracted to the stationary phase. Is he polar or non-polar? Is the stationary phase polar or non-polar? How polar or non-polar is the liquid? Is the liquid just water? If the liquid's water and it's very polar, then you would expect the polar things to be carried up here, and this is non-polar, be attracted to the paper. All right? So those are all the things you have to look at. Polarity, molecular mass, how heavy it is. The solubility, how well it dissolves. And the functional groups and how they interact with the solution or with the, um, with the uh, solid or uh, stationary phase. They all determine this. All right, now, everything I just wrote on that board, I could apply to, and I was careful the way I worded it, and I could apply it to all types of chromatography. We're going to start getting into a very specific types now. And we're going to do a lab on two of them, two types of chromatography. The one I'm not going to do a lab on, because I don't have the equipment, it's a very expensive piece of equipment, I'm going to show you two video clips of it. But we'll start with paper chromatography. Okay? <coughs> paper chromatography. In paper chromatography, your stationary phase is the filter paper. And your mobile phase is some liquid. Now, the liquid we're going to use is going to be a mixture of acetic acid and water in the one lab. In the other lab, the mobile phase, which we're going to do a, a column chromatography, the, the mobile phase will be a mixture of water and alcohol, isopropyl alcohol. Okay? And there'll be different mixtures, different concentrations. And what happens here, the substance you're trying to separate out is going to dissolve itself as, it, as, it, as the mobile phase, as the liquid travels up. It's going to dissolve itself in there and be carried along with it. The heavier ones, the ones that are more strongly attracted to the paper, are going to travel slower. And they're going to separate. So what, was, what started out as purple is going to end up being red and blue, one of them moving faster than the other. Okay? The sample is dissolved in the liquid mobile phase. It travels up through the paper by capillary action. This is what we'll be doing on Tuesday. We need a long time to do this one because it takes about 45 minutes for it to travel far enough to be separated out. And then we have to hang them up, let them dry, and do the RF values, which I'm going to show you how to do in a minute. Okay, that's, that's what that big graph, that big picture is down below. I'll explain to you what it looks like before, during, and after this uh, um, separation. Okay, so your picture you have that looks like this. Let's start at the beginning. What you'll do, like I just showed you with this guy right here, You'll put whatever it is you're testing. You're going to have four different food colorings and a water-soluble marker. You put a spot about that big on the paper, 
and you put it into this jar that contains this, the solvent. The solvent is, in this case, an acetic acid solution. It will start to climb. You'll see it climb, and it will separate out. You can't see it on your paper, but there's actually this spot was supposedly made of three colors. There's this yellow here, there's this purple here, and you, you probably can't see it. You see a little bit of blue there? Okay. All right. So it gets, as it travels up and up and up, it separates out. The yellow, the purple, and the blue all separated out. Okay. I can actually do calculations with this. And I can compare two different things. I can do a chromatogram for a substance, and then I can do it for something else and see does it doesn't have the same dye in it. And the way I'd be able to tell that is by measuring the RF value. Now, what is an RF value? RF equals, you look at the, down below there, DS over DF. Write this down below. That's what the RF means. It's a calculation. It's a very simple calculation. All it's going to do is measure the distance traveled by the substance. That's what the DS is, the distance traveled by the substance. Divide that by the distance traveled by the, the liquid solvent front, the solvent front. Think of the F being for front, how far along the solvent moves. Now, since you can't see this one on the top, I didn't even put them in here. Um, you probably on your paper can only see the purple and the yellow markers, can you? Right? Barely even the yellow. Yeah. Well, either way, you want to label these. Okay? Your DF is right there. That's how far the water level moved, or in our case, the acetic acid solution moved. This guy would be the DS1, so he's separated in one color, and the other distance traveled by the substance. There. What do you think the largest value you can get for an RF value is? One, exactly. You see why? The colors can't move further than the front, right? So you'll always be dividing this number by a larger number. So basically, you're always going to have a fraction, or at the worst, one for your RF value. Okay? All right. So that's what we'll be doing and seeing this done for us on Tuesday. Tomorrow, we're going to do a different one. I'll get to that one in a minute. But there's, there is a third kind, which actually I put second here, and uh, it's called gas chromatography. You hit that light for me after you copy that. Thing. Or is that, you already have that, right? Yeah. All right, hit that light for me. Gas chromatograms, gas chromatography, it's kind of neat. And I have two videos to show you here. The first one is very short, and it's kind of like on the inner workings of the machine. The second one is a more modern video. The first one's an older one, you can tell right away. And it's not great quality, but the second one's better. But the first one does show very well. You have to follow the little thing. I'll probably stop it once or twice and show you. It doesn't take very long to show it. Watch. It's a method of separating a mixture of compounds, which can be vaporized into its various constituents. It consists, quite simply, of a very fine coil tube, usually made of glass or stainless steel, which has a pure carrier gas flowing through it constantly and at a precisely controlled now watch temperature. Here. Distributed throughout the coil, you have a porous absorbent. At one end, you inject the liquid mixture of compounds. This vaporizes immediately in the heat. Notice the difference. And the vapor is carried by the speeds gas at which are moving. Since each of the constituents of the mixture has different chemical and physical properties, some will be more slowed down by the absorbent than others. So they move through the coil at different speeds. Okay, you got that? Did you see that? I'll, 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 I can show it to you again. But basically, you shoot in here with a, a, a needle, a small, very small volume of a mixture of chemicals. Okay? Well, they're being pushed by a gas through this. The gas is an inert gas. It's a gas we don't want to have react with anything. And if we go back to where it starts at, all right, again, right here, that the column is packed with like a, a material that's going to absorb things. Okay? Uh, so, uh, as it goes through, absorbent. some things are going to move Another faster than others. The All that goes in here, this, vaporizes immediately this guy's moving heat. real fast, and, the and he'll be out there in a second and he'll have a blink that'll come out on your paper. This guy's moving the slower, the that guy's moving a little bit has faster different than chemical and physical properties. Some will be more slowed down by the absorbent than others. Okay, now, let's look at a, a larger scale pullback for this in a little bit better video, better quality video, you can see it better. 
Gas chromatography, GC, is a method of separating mixtures and is particularly suited to mixtures of fairly volatile liquids. As in all chromatographic methods, there is a mobile phase, in this case a gas, that carries the components of the mixture over a stationary phase. In this case, the stationary phase is a tube called a column, packed with solid or coated with a high boiling point liquid. The components of the mixture leave the column in order of volatility, the most volatile first. This is the complete instrument, with the computer control system on the right. The sample is injected here. From this injection port, the sample passes into the column, which is kept in a temperature-controlled oven. Columns are normally wound into a spiral to save space. This capillary column is 30 <coughs> meters long. This is much shorter, about one meter. The properties of the column and its filling are chosen for the particular separation that is to be carried out. The components of the mixture are carried through the column by a stream of inert helium gas, the mobile phase. The more volatile the component, and the less it interacts with the stationary phase, the faster it travels through the column. At the other end of the column is a detector that detects each component of the mixture as it comes out of the column and also measures its amount. This instrument has a flame ionization detector which consists of a hydrogen flame burning in air. As a substance leaves the column, it burns in this flame producing ions which can be detected by measuring the electrical conductivity of the flame. By the way, does that look familiar to you? When do we burn things in a flame? To, to determine their, uh, remember that from Chem 1? Yeah. Remember the flame test? Yeah. Okay. Glass yeah, it was those little glasses. Glass. So when, when, the, when the material gets to there, it burns in the flame, and that changes the, uh, you know, ions are now burning, ions in particular we could see, perhaps burning different colors if we were, but we're, this is just detecting when they get through the actual um, column. And the first ones to get through, she uses the word volatile. That means that it evaporates very readily and it's very light. Okay, the most volatile ones are going to go through very quickly. All right, the least volatile ones will go through, and the ones that are attractable will not. The hydrogen for the flame comes from this cylinder here. Before beginning a separation, the operator must set the flow rate of the gases and the temperature of the oven. The temperature of the inlet port is also set at a level that ensures that the sample is fully vaporized and the flame ionization detector must be lit. Here, uh, we will separate this. a mixture of methanol and methyl benzene. Here what you call that? Methanol and methyl benzene. Now, that's a British accent for, what, what is she saying for uh, methyl? What do you think that is? Methyl. Methyl benzene is, did you see what was written on the bottle? Toluene. Toluene. Watch again, you'll see it in a second. The bottle is a mixture. They put together some methanol, which is a very, it's, a, it's the lightest alcohol, right? Along with benzene ring with the methyl group on it, which is, which is toluene. Okay? See there? About 0.1 microliters is taken up in a very small amount. Syringe. See how small the syringe is? Very small. It is then injected into the inlet port through a self-sealing rubber disc called a septum. The first peak is methanol, the more volatile component. Its retention time, that is the time taken for it to pass through the column, is about one minute. The second peak, with a retention time of about 1.5 minutes, is the less volatile methyl benzene. Oops, I'm sorry. Did you notice something about those peaks? I'll scroll over to there. They're different sizes, aren't they? You know what that means? The area under that peak is, is proportional to the amount that was in the percentage that was in the, the mixture. So if I look at this graph, I know two things about this mixture. 
I know which one was more volatile, which one was, was going the lightest one. And that would be the uh, methanol. I also know of that mixture, what was most of that mixture? It was this guy, right? Because it's a larger area on the curve. Okay. 1.5 minutes is the less volatile methyl benzene. Its peak has a larger area, showing that there is more of it in the mixture. You can actually tell exactly how much based the on the area that the computer can do. Retention times and peak areas. Okay. The area under each peak is proportional to the amount of each component. The computer is, calculates this. You should recognize that as tidy. And CH3OH. This instrument is used for undergraduate practical sessions, and samples are run singly as and when each student is ready. In this alternative instrument, the gas <laughs> chromatograph is on the left, and the detector is a mass spectrometer, which runs the mass spectrum of each component as it comes out of the column. This can be particularly useful when analyzing an unknown mixture, as the mass spectrum can help to identify each component. That's one of the things, called GCMS, I guess, a gas chromatograph mass spectrometry. Uh, put that light on for me. That's something that they constantly use on shows like CSI, where they're trying to identify an unknown substance. Is it a poison? Is it whatever? You run it through that, and at the end, the machine, the last machine after the gas chromatogram, separates it. You also get an identification of it. Uh, the mass spectrum runs that on it. So, basically, here's your situation. You have a gas, which should be an inert gas. She said that. A couple of places they said an inert gas. What does inert mean again? Doesn't react. Helium is a great inert gas. Look where helium is in the periodic table. He's the smallest, highest up, noble gas. He doesn't react with hardly anybody. No, he doesn't want to react. Why not? He's got a filled energy level. He's happy. He's very happy. We know that about all the noble gases, but of all the noble gases, helium is the most unreactive. So we push it through. Why don't I want my helium gas react? I don't want my thing that I push it through reacting. I don't want it react with the, what I've mixed together. It's going to change the components. I'm trying to identify this stuff. I'm trying to separate it. I'm not trying to change it. So it gets pushed through by the helium. You inject it here, it gets pushed through that helium, goes through a whole column, comes out the other side, and it, reach, it reads a peak of how much and when, how long it took. Right? This is all called gas chromatography. Right? Stationary phase here is a column packed with an inert so solid or liquid. Okay? And you've just seen that in both little things, and you have a graph, a picture of it on your paper. The mobile phase in gas chromatography is a gas, no surprise there. And it should be an inert gas. You inject the sample you're trying to separate and or identify, or both. You inject that into one end of that column. It gets pushed through by the inert gas, and then you register how long it takes for it to get through, the retention time of the substance based on how much it's attracted to the column, or how heavy it is. Okay? Samples vaporize, and then push through the column. So when you're done, you're going to get a readout. Uh, in the old days, we get a piece of paper that read, read out the answers. Nowadays, it's probably almost all done on computers, I would imagine. I haven't seen one being used in a long time. But here's one that I had last time we went down to, uh, I believe this was at Susquehanna, using an actual, uh, using an actual gas chromatogram. You can see uh, the peaks. From this, this is one we had run off for us. And I think those are, I can barely read it, but methanol, ethanol, and uh, something else I can't read. Isopropyl alcohol, perhaps. And if that's the case, it would make sense. This is methanol, this is ethanol. And it's like, as it runs this way, the first peak to come out would be the most volatile one, the one that went through the fastest, the lightest one. 
And then oh, this one took like, three minutes, took, and this one took seven minutes to get that one out. It would be the heaviest one. That makes sense. Okay? So the detector analyzes how fast it moves through and how much. The area under that curve is, is proportional to the amount of the substance in that mixture, percentage of that mixture that's made up of that substance. Look good? All right. So that's pretty interesting stuff, and it's one application for chromatography. There's one other one I want to mention to you briefly. This one won't take as long uh, because we're going to do another lab on this one, and there's not any calculations to do like there was for, for uh, paper chromatography. This is one we will not see. Gas chromatography, I showed you those two video clips, and I've talked about it a little bit more because we are not gonna, I don't own one. They're very expensive. I don't own one. No, I don't think any high school owns a gas chromatogram. However, uh, when Mrs. Spencer was here, I know she used to have, uh, you ever see those science in action people from down in Bloomsburg would come up, or Wilkes, I think, had one. They're like a mobile science lab. I think Mr. Uh, if you ever had Mr. Stair when you were in middle school. Was he still here? Okay, well, they would have these people come in, and they would run. They would actually bring their mobile uh, gas chromatogram, and, and they would run some stuff. I forget what they did. Probably with chlorophyll or something like that. All right. Um, actually, no, it was something to do with carbon dioxide and leaf uh, photosynthesis, but I can't remember exactly. Anyway, we don't own one because they're expensive. Now, we are going to do, oh, one last thing about this, reading a graph. Look, if I can ask you, I'm going to give you on the test, guaranteed, and on the next worksheet, a chromatogram like this, a gas chromatogram. You can't tell me a lot about this, but you can tell me some things. You can tell me, of these guys that came out here, who was the lightest one? Who was the attracted to? Hydrogen, he's right over here. You could also tell me who do I have the most of? Who would it be? Carbon dioxide. Okay, for that sample of mi that mixture of gases, that's basically what we have. That's what it would look like. Okay, all right. If I gave you a graph, it would look like that. Now, why is this changing? There we go. Okay. Oh, wait, what happened to uh, Colin? I guess. Oh, I know where it is. <laughs> That's what I did. One second. The words are black as well as the background. <laughs> Last one's column chromatography. I, was, I accidentally did that. Uh, column chromatography. This is what we're going to use for column chromatography. It's actually, there's other kinds, but this is the easiest one for us to use. It's called a SEPPAC cartridge. It looks like it's stuffed with cotton. Okay, That's what it looks like, the consistency of cotton. But it's not. Um, and what you're going to do is you'll draw up some solution you want to uh, separate, and you'll push it through that set pack cartridge. And what will happen is, depending on how well it's attracted there, it will either stick to it or it will go through it. Okay. So the column uh, chromatography, is the stationary phase is a solid adsorbent in a column. Our column is a very short setback cartridge, but you can use other kinds of columns. They can be very tall, sit on a bench, a table, you know, and uh, they are used for separation of different things. You, you pick the, your uh, method based on what you're trying to separate and what phase it's in. You can even change, given the same method, gas photography, you can even change the columns and separate for something, or for separating something else out. Okay? So we are going to uh, do this exact same lab. We're going to do a column chromatography lab, where the mobile phase is going to be alcohol, different percentages of alcohol, that are going to separate out through that set pack cartridge, grape Kool-Aid colors. Grape Kool-Aid, obviously, is what color? Purple, right. And what, what, so when I go and do this, you're going to, when you do this on, um, on uh, tomorrow, actually, this is the one we're doing tomorrow, you're going to be able to separate that purple color into what two colors you think? Blue and red. Yeah. And you'll see that tomorrow. It's pretty neat. Okay. This is often used, column chromatography, to separate or purify a substance. 
All right, not necessarily to identify things, more so to purify them. All right, you want to take out some impurities that are in there, you can run it through a column chromatography, and it will come out cleaner. And remember, going back now to, to summarize from the very beginning, the very first words I told you here, the, so much of chemistry is just separating out things you don't want and from things you do want, okay? You don't realize that, but that, I'd say probably 90% you know, of chemistry comes down to that. There's the reaction. You've got to make what you're trying to make. But once it's made, you've got all this other crap there you've got to get rid of. And that's where most of your time is spent, getting rid of that other junk. All right, good enough.